All right. Welcome back from the green room, everybody. Uh, Maurice, let's just do a quick check with you to make sure you can still unmute. Yep. Okay, great. And Jody is the host for today. Are you good? Can you unmute, speak, all that stuff? Hello? Yes, great. Me? Yes. yes. Perfect. Okay, I'm excellent. I'm going to shut my door so I don't get an echo. No worries. We'll get started <laughs> in just about 30 seconds or so. we got a good crowd today for you, Maurice. Uh, a lot of people from outside the physics department who don't normally come to our seminars. I knew this would be an interesting topic, so I'm glad we advertised. All right, well, um, people are still gonna be joining in in, in the next minute or two. Um, everyone knows I, I spend a minute talking before we actually get started with the real thing. So I'm gonna go ahead and start my talking. So first, let me welcome everybody back to the SMU Physics Department Speaker Series for spring 2021. Uh, today, we conclude the February series and its ongoing theme of probing the unknown. But before we move on to introduce the speaker and, uh, and so forth, I wanted to comment a little bit on the events of the last uh, seven to 10 days in Texas. Um, I wanted to begin by acknowledging that a lot of people uh, went through a lot of hardship last week, and some people are still going through hardships right now. Um, those include, but are not limited to, two day or even longer power and heat outages. I'm aware that some people even today don't have proper functioning heating and cooling, although now that the temperature is about 70 Fahrenheit outside, it doesn't matter so much. Um, floods or running water outages were a real challenge to a lot of people in the physics community due to things like burst pipes and a lack of telecommunication connectivity, boil water notifications and, and so forth. Personally, I haven't gone some, through something like this since hurricanes in Connecticut growing up. If any of you out there are still suffering serious consequences from this event and you, you don't think you can handle it on your own and you're not sure where to turn, there are resources available at the county, state, city, and even SMU levels. So please make sure to reach out to me or Lacey Bro in the main office. Uh, Lacey's connected today. And just let us know so that we can direct you to resources intended to provide assistance. Okay. So with that in mind, let's return to the seminar for today. And in a moment, I'm going to hand things over to Professor Jody Cooley to introduce our speaker, Dr. Maurice Garcia Severas. But before we do that, just a quick reminder to our audience on Zoom. I've got all the microphones locked down except for the hosts and co-hosts. So if you want to ask a question, just open up that chat window now and be ready to type the word speak or something like that in the chat window, just to indicate that you wish to speak. What we'll then do is if it's during the talk, We'll interrupt uh, the speaker, may probably at the next slide transition. If it's at the end, we'll get you in a little queue for speaker question and answer time. Uh, and then the moder me usually as moderator will unmute you and call on you so you can ask your question and, and chat with the speaker. This event is being recorded on Zoom and being simultaneously live streamed on YouTube. So let me now welcome Professor Jody Cooley to introduce today's speaker. Thank you, Steve. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Maurice Garcia Severus today. He received his PhD from Cornell in 1994 for the measurement of VCB in the Clio E plus E minus collider experiment. He was a postdoc and then a scientist and now a senior scientist at LBNL where he's worked on the CDF and ATLAS experiments. He focused on development of readout integrated circuits for the silicon versus vertex detectors and was recognized for his contribution in this area with an APS fellowship in 2015. In 2013, he co-founded the CERN RD53 collaboration to develop pixel detector readout chips for ATLAS and CMS, and he has served as the co-spokesperson since then. Um, adding a personal note here, um, I just want people to understand Maurice is actually quite well respected in the community for his research and development. Um, he was actually uh, the chairman for the very first um, graduate, uh, DOE graduate research instrumentation. I forget the, I forget what the acronym is, but the first JIRA, um, the first JIRA fellowship. And it really was quite a heavy lift that he, that he did um, in, you know, pushing 
um, helping to push to make sure that graduate students could get, um, essentially could get these fellowships for doing R&D and bringing the importance of R&D back to the forefront um, in high energy physics. Uh, since 2018, he has been a PI for the LBNL Quantum Information Science Enabled Discovery um, Program of the DOE. And we're very happy to have you here, Maurice. And I know many of us are, are looking forward to your talk. Thank you, Jody, for the very nice introduction. And yeah, and, and in case you missed it from that introduction, I have no credentials in quantum information science. <laughs> <laughs> no. So uh, if you ask deep, too, too deep questions, I might just deflect. <laughs> uh, so let me share my screen. Uh, yeah, I just want to make sure there aren't any problems lingering with sharing. Good. Okay, excellent. Um, okay, so if that's okay, maybe uh, one last check and... Yep, that looks great. Great. So I'll start then. Um, in this talk, I'm going to introduce you to uh, a, a, new, a, a new program launched by the US, which is called the National Quantum Initiative. Uh, and uh, you probably heard a lot of noise about it, but hopefully I try to put it all into a, a coherent context. And I'll try to answer the question of why is this happening now, since quantum, from quantum, uh, quantum physics is not new. And, um, uh, I'll cover the centers that have been established uh, for this initiative, as well as the high energy physics program. This is a bit of a high energy physics centered talk for those uh, members uh, of the audience from outside. Uh, so I'll, I'll go about, I'll, I'll go into examples of uh, quantum information science for high energy physics. So what, what is it that, that we, that high energy physics can, uh, can gain from, or can derive from quantum information science uh, uh, for, from this whole boon of quantum information science. And basically I'll just give examples uh, and, uh, and then I'll conclude. So the National Quantum Initiative, um, the, the material that I'm presented on that is drawn mainly from this link. Uh, so I encourage you to, if you're interested in knowing more about it, go, it's a very nice uh, historical summary of how it was set up, how it came to be, et cetera. Um, so it's um, it took it took some years to get to get it established. So there was a first um, uh, report in two thousand and nine uh, on the on a federal vision for quantum information science, which and you can find the report there. Uh, and eventually, that led to a, a policy forum at the White House on quantum information science. Uh, after which, there were calls for a national quantum initiative. And then finally, in 2019, uh, the Senate and then the House uh, passed the uh, NQI Act uh, to fund uh, this, um, this initiative. And there's the website that you can go to for, uh, for the NQI. So why, why was this done now? So there's a scientific reason and also a technical reason in terms of sci kind of a his history of science um, uh, uh, perspective, the quantum mechanics, of course, since its uh, formulation in 1925, uh, struggled with uh, questions, sort of we could call metaphysical questions about what it implies. Uh, and you know, I'm going to summarize the issues that people were, um, uh, were worried about with the catchy phrase, spooky action at a distance, uh, which, which you'll hear a lot. Uh, from many sources, uh, probably Einstein regrets ever coming up with it. Um, but um, uh, basically this implies, this was taken to imply that quantum mechanics is not a complete description of reality uh, because it, it kind of fails this text. But then since, when, since 1964 until now, uh, experiments uh, started showing that essentially that spooky action at a distance is not some problem that it really is how nature behaves, uh, even at, a, at macroscopic levels. Uh, and this, of course, has, you know, rephrases the problem uh, for people who, who want to focus on problems that, well, well if this is true, it, it's then physics non-local. But that's, that's maybe a topic for another uh, presentation. I'm not really going to go into that today. Um, 
but then once once it was shown that these uh, strange effects of quantum mechanics are really not just some artifact of, of some incomplete theory, but they really are the way things work. Uh, there was, you know, a more and more of an effort of to figure out how to make use of of these effects uh, for doing something uh, for do for practical purposes, essentially. And this is a transition from quantum mechanics to quantum information science of not just worrying about these weird effects, but saying, well, th there they are. Let's let's use them for something. And so there's a list here of a bit of US NSF centric list of of milestones in the development of quantum information science, uh, which I list here. So, so there's the no cloning theorem. Uh, uh, there's the um, basically uh, uh, metrology, uh, quantum metrology, quantum metrology of foundations. Uh, there's the um, uh, basic building lot so that the, the qubit basically the physical physical qubit uh definition and then and then the uh you know the you know the computing Fourier transform algorithm which which then was used by the one that you all recognize which is which is Shor's algorithm uh which which basically says yeah, quantum computers can crack all encryption codes uh and uh, and this is really these were all scientific breakthroughs and milestones, but mostly unnoticed outside of the communities working on them. Whereas Shor's algorithm then finally, you know, really got the attention of uh, defense <laughs> and uh, and and uh, government that this is a, something that should be taken very seriously. So this is really what kicked off the, the emphasis for for the government getting involved into doing something about about the quantum information science. Uh, so, so this is just on the side that that you know the, this, about, on this question of physics non-locality is that, uh, in fact, you know the, the current more current research re, uh, research is looking at um, at entanglement uh, uh, as 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 a very fundamental uh, um, very fundamental thing that really is even more fundamental than space time and so locality in fact is not really that critical because it's not really, it's not the fundamental concept. It's an entanglement is more fundamental than locality. And Maurice, we have a question for you. Let me unmute Jacob here. Uh, so Jacob, you should be able to unmute yourself and speak. All right, hello there. Uh, first, I'd like to say thank you all. Um, and now I would like to ask about, you say the government was involved. Why did the government become involved at that point? Was it maybe a political reason or was the information just so grueling? Well, well, I think, uh, again, it's, there's a timeline. And so I showed it before. It, it's not, it wasn't a sudden involvement that there was, um, you know, lots of uh, um, preparation leading up to it. But basically, uh, the, the reasons became more and more compelling over time. And I think that the, 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 the motivation for, for having, uh, for leading, for having a leader, leading role in quantum computing and sort of kickstarting a quantum computing industry, uh, you know, just became too compelling. And so that's, so yes, there, I'm sure there's political reasons as well, but, but well, I think you, you, made the, you made the point Maurice that, uh, once Shor's algorithm was published, it became clear that it had national security impl implications, yeah. right? So, because you could crack existing uh, encryption in, in principle using a quantum computer with this algorithm. Okay. Right. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for the question. So, um, so then in addition to the, what, to the, to what I just covered, there's a, also a technology, a parallel technology, uh, progression that leads to this happening now. And the fact is that it really wasn't that easy to, to do anything of what's, what's being done now. 20 years ago, just because the technology wasn't there. So, so the, the, the top of the list is, is refrigeration, which seems like a mundane thing, but, but to re really a lot of this uh, QIS um, uh, development uh, has to be done at uh, sub Kelvin temperatures. And of course, uh, the, the, the prime device to get to sub Kelvin temperatures is a, a helium dilution refrigerator that was invented in 1964, but but really compact 
uh, fridges that you could actually purchase uh, commercially made and with, with sufficient cooling power to do, uh, to do lots of things at, at sub Kelvin temperature didn't really became available, become available until the nineties and, and only widely available at, at a modest cost, something that lots of, uh, people can afford, um, uh, at, um, in the last decade. So, so without that, you know, not much could be done. Uh, then also, also atom traps, uh, were developed on the same kind of time scale, uh, lots of RF electronics, uh, RF amplifiers um, uh, that are needed uh, and, uh, and enabling advances in laser technology, for example, microfabrication and digital electronics. So, so these all allowed the kind of things that are being done today to, to be done in a reasonable way by many, many groups, as opposed to taking huge efforts just to read out the device. Um, so now let me move on to describing what, what's happened with the uh, NQI, what, what it's led to uh, a number of centers being created. So first, um, uh, the National Institute of Standards, NIST, already had uh, centers devoted to uh, the type of uh, investigation that, that, that's being done under, under NQI, uh, but they, of course, have been uh, um, boosted by the NQI. And so these are the... GILA Center in Boulder and the um, Joint Quantum Institute and the Center for Quantum Information Science in Maryland. And, uh, you know, they've been doing the kind of uh, development that's needed for QIS for 20 years, but which is a direct extension of the NIST core research in precision time and electrical metrology. And their program includes sensing and metrology above all, because that's really the NIST core competency, as well as communication simulation of complex materials and computing. Um, so now, in addition, there's the National Science Foundation has three new centers, and they, they are planning to uh, have more in the future. But right now, there's three uh, as part of this uh, Quantum Leap Challenge Institute, QLCI. And so here, here they're listed, the three uh, QLCI centers, um, which sort of cover different areas each. So, um, so architectures and networks, uh, present and future quantum computing and uh, enhanced sensors and distribution. So you see networking, computing and sensing uh, are, are the three uh, centers and they're also uh, uh, distributed uh, among different institutes in the country. Each of those centers is not really located. I mean, it's, it's, it's based at the PI's institute, but they really involve many universities and labs in each center. And then the Department of Energy also has, Office of Science, also has, uh, has established five centers, uh, which are QNEXT at each of the five main national labs that the DOE uh, science works on, works with. So the, the QNEXT center um, at Ar Argonne National Lab, the C2QA center at Brookhaven National Lab, the SQMS center at Fermilab, the QSA center at, at Berkeley, and the QSC Center at Oak Ridge. Now, the centers weren't just created overnight. There, there was a DOE uh, kind of a ramp up of investments leading up to the establishment of, of the centers in, tw in 2020, this past fiscal year. Um, and in particular, um, some of that development involves the quantized program, which is the main subject of my talk, which was started back in 2019. Fiscal year 2019, and um, and so so this is mostly what I'm going to talk about next. Uh, you'll notice here something called quantum internet. This is in this case simply the sort of the combination of all these uh, prior investments into sort of a coherent program. So the uh, quantized program of the uh, Office of High Energy Physics of the DOE which stands for Quantum Information Science Enabled Discovery, um, has a, a number of thrusts as shown in, in this uh, chart. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, including theory, uh, quantum computing, uh, and quantum sensing, as well as this green bubble here, small QIS experiments. So uh, these uh, blue thrusts were um, uh, there was a call for proposals many proposals were submitted and uh, a pretty large number of them were selected and funded 
in fiscal year 18, and then another call in fiscal year 19. And then uh, last fiscal year 2020, there was a consolidation of the uh, awarded proposals into sort of blocks or consortia, and then each of the blocks or consortia were uh, extended, you know, with following reviews uh, by a three three year uh, by three years, and and so at Berkeley we have one of these uh, consortia, um, uh, quantized consortia, and there's there's a number of them around the country. Um, this small experiments uh, bubble. Um, there was a call for uh, experiments uh, that used quant uh, uh, QIS technology for high energy physics experiments in uh, fiscal year 19, but just two awards were funded. Um, and then there's another call in preparation for this fiscal year, so keep an eye out for that. So now uh, I will, uh, let's see, yeah, I'm, I will cover the thrusts. Uh, what, um, um, try to cover the thrust simply by giving examples of work in each area. And, and the sensors is going to be the main thing I cover um, uh, following, uh, following uh, computing and uh, theory. So in terms of theory, um, I'll give an example of uh, work going on in information scrambling, which and what this means in this case, scrambling is entangling information among many different degrees of freedom which is what is expected to happen to any information that falls into black holes, which seems like a very exotic thing. But in terms of understanding gravity and information, this is a very, very useful theoretical uh, place to work. Um, so uh, one can, in principle, recover the information that uh, dropped into a black hole uh, by doing a massive quantum calculation on the ongoing Hawking radiation. So black, black holes evaporate by emitting Hawking radiation very, very slowly. And uh, pri previously, it was thought that this information was, was uh, devoid of any information about what came in. Later on, it was shown that, that in fact, uh, the, the, the Hawking radiation contains information about, about what fell into the black hole. Uh, but it was thought that you had to wait for the black hole to evaporate, which normally takes a lot more than the age of the universe. And now it's been uh, uh, calculated that in fact, you don't need to wait for evaporation and you can recover information uh, by looking at the uh, entanglement correlations in the Hawking radiation. Uh, in other words, that the information is distributed equally among all the degrees of freedom, it's, it's scrambled, and therefore you don't need to wait for the whole black hole to evaporate. It all comes out all the time. Um, and um, this kind of uh, um, theory is, is connected to solving the black hole information paradox which I don't have time to get into. Um, uh, but the point is that one can now test this kind of theory uh, in computing hardware that can scramble information just like a black hole does, but this time using qubits. And so there's, um, there's a, an example of a couple of papers uh, uh, looking exactly at this, at this kind of phenomenon, theoretically. And so, so um, in this classical cartoon, this is, this is the, the typical thing uh, uh, for experiments that show entanglement, where you have a pair of, of photons or particles that called a EPR pair, uh, Einstein, Podolsa, Rosen, after that experiment, uh, which, is, which is produced in an entangled state. And then, and then you can measure one of them, and then that tells you what you should measure in the other one. But that's not relevant to the black holes because a black hole isn't just one state. It's a very large number of states all entangled. And so that's what's being uh, studied in these papers is the entanglement. Uh, how can an entanglement, how can measure, measuring something about uh, the um, many degree of freedom uh, state, highly entangled state, tell you about the other many degrees of freedom that you're not measuring? And uh, so that's that's an example of sorry of the theoretical uh, work being done. There's there's three other examples uh, that I listed here. By no means a com complete list, but just I thought they were interesting. That uh, that one can well, you can look at, but I don't have time to go a lot into theory, and I'm not a theorist. So if you asked any questions, I probably couldn't answer them. Um, so in terms of theory, the the Heinrich physics study of uh, general relati relativity. And information uh, predates uh, quantum information science and MQI. It's been going on for a, 
for a long, long time. And there's an excellent review of that that I point you to here. Um, and uh, what NQI brings is, the, is new platforms to test theories and concepts. So the connections between quantum information, general relativity, quantum field theory, were all well known uh, before, the, before this time. And uh, so this is what indeed suggests that added QIS work in systems other than black holes and high energy theories can indeed help advance this theory research, which is what's going on. So now moving on to computing, uh, I give some examples of work going on there. So this uh, first example is um, uh, the computation of, um, of uh, uh, cross sections and, and, and rates of many uh, processes that have many fermions in the final state, uh, quantum chromodyna chromodynamics processes, so, so uh, strong interaction processes that have lots of uh, fermions in the final state. And these are very difficult to calculate. They're non-perturbative. And they're, they're, we have mod, um, simulation uh, programs that, that sort of try to figure out uh, what, the, what the final states are, but they don't take into account entanglement. They, uh, um, so, uh, so with a quantum computer, you can, in principle, calculate these types of final states properly, meaning with, with the proper entanglement uh, built in. And so there's a, there's a, a paper on that here. And uh, there was an implementation on a six qubit, um, six logical qubit uh, platform, which is something that already exists. And so this 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 is why you represent that quantum computer program. And uh, and this particular program is for two fermions in the initial state and two fermions in the final state, uh, with an interaction. And it basically um, uh, this paper shows that the calculation can be done, and and it actually runs on simulation simulations of the hardware, uh, of the um, existing uh, qubit hardware and produces the right results. Um, now, the problem with existing, any, any existing uh, quantum computing uh, hardware is that they're called sort of noisy intermediate uh, scale quantum computing because the qubits are, do not have a very high fidelity. They're very noisy. And so whenever you use real systems, you have to take this noise into account. And, and here's another paper that that applies a statistical methods of unfolding noise, detector noise from measurements, which is something we have to do in, for example, measurements uh, at the Large Hadron Collider. Uh, and, uh, but, and these statistical methods that were developed for unfolding noise from measuring top quarter cross sections or something in a Large Hadron Collider can now be applied to read out of qubits from a quantum computer. And this paper shows that, that in certain um, uh, areas of phase space, uh, these these methods uh, have much better performance at the standard um, uh, standard noise reduction algorithms that that quantum computer developers are using. So so that's that's the the black line here compared to the uh, standard algorithms that people use in industry, uh, which are the blue and the red, which have this horrible oscillation um, in these particular, in this, in these cases, this is not an all phase space, but in some cases, some initial conditions, they can produce this, whereas the, the, um, the unfolding methods from mind physics are much better behaved. And then there's also quantum annealers, which are not general purpose computers. Uh, uh, and these, these can be used to solve hard combinatorial problems, uh, such as, uh, high luminosity LHC track reconstruction. And so here's, here are results of a, pan recognition algorithm for quantum annealers. Uh, and it's comparing the, the, uh, the way that uh, the computations are done classically in normal computers, which take a very long time, um, uh, to the way it's been done using a quantum annealer from D-Wave. Uh, and the results are basically identical. Um, so, so that is a promising type of problem to run on annealers. Here's another example of uh, training a neural network for Higgs data analysis. Uh, and in this example, uh, they showed that um, using a quantum annealer, the training can be done using much fewer data uh, than, the than is needed to train in a, a traditional way. So this shows the comparison of the rock curves. So, so up, and, up and to the right is good. Um, so this blue rock curve is better than this 
uh, brownish dashed rod curve. And the blue curve is using a quantum annealer and the brownish curve is using traditional methods with only a hundred events to train on, which is a very small sample. If you have 20,000 events to train on, which is more of a typical sample, then actually the traditional methods do are optimal, uh, do better than the, than the quantum annealer. But the point is that quantum annealers can somehow uh, provide an advantage when you, when you have very small training samples. So in quantum computing, the, the question being, being asked is, if someone, somebody handed you a quantum computer or annealer, what would you do with it? And so uh, high-energy physics problems make excellent beta testers for this new technology. Uh, and that's, what the, that's where the work is focusing on. So, so basically people who want to beta test quantum computers for solving problems that arise in, in um, high-energy physics. So for example, non-perturbative non QCD is naturally suited to qubit systems and large combinatorial problems are naturally suited to annealers. And the method developed, the methods developed to implement Hydrogen physics algorithms on current hardware can be more generally applicable. For example, the noise unfolding can be applied to any problem. And so the examples I showed, except for the Higgs one, were mainly from the LPL program. So finally, I come to the sensing uh, part of the talk, um, and which is the sort of the main part, because I'm an experimentalist, and that's mostly what I would work on. Um, so unlike the theory and computing thrusts, uh, sensing is very broad. And when you get into it, there's questions that will keep coming up. Like, um, is that a quantum sensor? <laughs> for example, is a phototube, a traditional phototube that has been around for decades, is that a quantum sensor? And, uh, and so obviously it's not something we want the quantized program to fund because it's again, old technology, but but it, it is, in, in a sense, a quantum sensor. And, um, and then another question that comes up is, how, how is that, how should that be part of the QIS program as opposed to a clever mousetrap that we should have built regardless? So, so these are harder questions to answer than they seem. And you will find uh, people try to give semantic answers, like um, QIS work is something we, we want to call quantum 2.0, well, photo, a photo tube is quantum 1.0. Um, but the, I, I don't like this. Not, this doesn't satisfy me, and I'm not going to talk about it anymore because this label, quantum 2.0, is just a label. It doesn't have a quantitative definition of, that you can calculate if something is quantum 2.0 or quantum 1.0. So another approach is to say that uh, uh, quantum sensors in the QIS development should have should make use of some features like superposition, entanglement, or back action evasion. And again, this, has, this leads to gray areas and, and, uh, and things uh, uh, that came out of QIS yet failed this condition. So I would rather maybe make an analogy with CMOS uh, that, that I think provides a more useful perspective. So in, um, in experimental energy physics, we have benefited tremendously from the CMOS industry. There are many detector technologies that have been developed alongside the march of Moore's law. Um, and in fact, every particle, modern particle physics detector heavily depends on integrated circuits. Um, but the, the main purpose of Moore's law has been to increase MIPS per dollar. So uh, instructions, million instructions per second per dollar. That's the main purpose of Moore's law for computers. Um, and it's just like the main goal of and QI is to kickstart quantum computing, the quantum computing industry. It's not to do, to find the uh, dark matter, right? So, um, so the, however, uh, the many, there are many HEP detector developments that would themselves not be regarded CMOS products. They're, you know, some passive component, for example, is not a CMOS product, uh, but they would only be, po they're only possible thanks to, and they were catalyzed by the CMOS industry development. So. So this is the analogy I want to make. So the, the NQI is trying to kickstart um, uh, a, a new industry for computing. And alongside with that, we can develop great new uh, science uh, uh, devices that, that can let us uh, find out you know, things about dark matter or, or gravity. So now I'll go move on to the, a bunch of examples on quantum sensing, which is by no means exhausted. 
and I'll try to move from, wow, that's definitely a new QIS capability to haven't we been doing that for years? <laughs> uh, and this and that just rebranding. So, so that's kind of the progression of the examples I'm gonna show yet. I, I'm gonna claim that all these are, are well, th these are all part of the quantized program. So you can get an impression from what the bread covered is. So I'm gonna cover photon te teleportation for long baseline optical telescope arrays, quantum non demolition measurement of RF photons, vacuum squeezing for noise uh, uh, below standard quantum limit, optomechanical mechanical resonators as photon de phonon detectors, quantum materials for dark matter detection, helium quantum evaporation and detection, and superconducting phonon detectors. So let's get going. In terms of uh, photon teleportation, um, for long baseline uh, optical arrays. So interferometry for, for uh, uh, telescope observations has been you know, around for a long time. And the classical picture of interferometry is this. You have a wave front coming from a distant source <clears throat> and you have uh, telescopes that are at some distance <clears throat> and you grab the signal from each of them and you interfere it. But this requires capturing the signal, not not recording it, but just, just moving it into a into a cable or a fiber. So a photon that goes into a fiber or a, or a microwave that goes into a coax cable. Uh, you're not actually doing anything to the signal. You're not disturbing it. You're interfering with another signal and then you're measuring. So that's a classical interferometer. And, and that works very well for electrical signals. You can, uh, you can interfere electrical signals from uh, the two ends of the earth. And this is in fact what was done in those pictures of the black hole that you saw uh, not that long ago, uh, the first images of an actual black hole with radio telescopes, with a very large array of radio telescopes covering basically the entire Earth. Now this, this works well for, for electrical signals, but it doesn't work well for optical signals. So, so optical baselines longer than tens of meters are not practical in this kind of interferometry. So the question is how can you build optical telescopes the size of the Earth. And uh, <clears throat> there's three papers here, three uh, covering work in this area that I would mention. Sorry. <clears throat> so the first is um, using a, uh, an entangled photon source um, <clears throat> on Earth that you then can send to the different telescopes so you send these entangled photons to wherever you need to send them, and then you and then you you uh, entangle them, and then, uh, again with the fo incoming photons at the telescopes, and you measure the results. And this is a way to teleport basically photons from one telescope to another. That's what quantum teleportation is. Um, now this would be so that the, the paper is there, and this would be great, except that we don't have this entangled photon source of the right properties that can distribute the photons this far away. So it's not yet something that we can build today. So another paper to try to get around that is to say, forget the entangled photon source on Earth. Let's use two photon sources on the sky. So, so the source you want to study and a reference bright source that can be any star that you like. And then we, we entangle those two sources at the different telescopes and we measure them there. And then we have to do some math, but this paper goes, goes through the math uh, to, to say that this can also allow you to do interferometry. <clears throat> this is called two photon interferometry. Now this, in this case, this suffers from limited statistics. The rates are just not high enough here. Um, and that's, that's the problem. And so then the final one that tries to get around this is, but again, can't be implemented yet, is to record, to save the photons from each of the telescope in, in so-called quantum memories. And then using qubits, interfere those quantum memories. Uh, you can, you can um, uh, use quantum networks to move the, 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 the quantum memory contents from one place to another and interfere them and then get the results. So that would be the ultimate uh, high rate uh, telescope, optical telescope array using quantum memories and quantum networks. Okay, so now we'll mo I'll move on to uh, non-demolition measurement of RF photons. And this is something that's used, that's being starting to be used in axion searches. 
And this is a, a 2010 paper, which you know obviously predates the NQI and all that, not from physics, but from material science, uh, <clears throat> not from high energy, high energy physics, sorry, but from material science. <clears throat> Showing how the non-demolition measurement of RF photons actually works and, and implementing it in a device. And so in this case, you have a cavity where you store a bunch of photons, uh, the RF photons, and you, and you stored N photons and you want to find N. Um, and so the way you do that is you have, you couple this cavity to a qubit system, a uh, single qubit uh, with a measurement, with its own measurement cavity. And, uh, and there is no energy exchange in this coupling, but the Hamiltonian of this qubit actually uh, depends on the number of photons in this cavity. And then, <clears throat> Because of that, you can reset the, this qubit, <coughs> let it evolve according to the Hamiltonian and measure it over and over without destroying the, num the photons in here. That's a non-demolition part. And you can measure over and over and then average and then that way find the number of photons yeah, with arbitrarily high precision. And this is how it's being implemented now in this paper of 2020 for an axiom readout. And there you see some results with the zero, one, and two photons in the storage cavity. And there's the transmon for the qubit and the readout cavity. Now, um, so I covered, I covered teleportation, uh, non-demolition measurement, and now this is squeezing. So you might have heard of that term before. The poster child for uh, squeezing is a LIGO experiment where they have this projection from uh, 2013 that if that uh, the normal uh, operation of LIGO uh, achieves this uh, noise uh, figure as a function of frequency, um, this dashed curve here, um, but the black one, uh, but if you can use squeezed light uh, in, the, in the interferometer, they, they project that you can get down to this level. So in the region of interest, of course, the noise is much lower. Note that the noise is actually higher down here where the very low frequencies were where LIGO is not really making uh, measurements. Um, and so, so this is the apparatus, which is rather complicated. And this is the squeezed light. And I'm not going to try to explain that. Instead, I'm going to move to a much simpler version of squeezing, because squeezing has been around for a while, uh, meaning a long time, and actually has a classical description. And it's not, so this is one of those things where you're getting into, wait a minute, this is, this is not new. <coughs> Um, so, so this, th I chose this paper, there's many uh, possibilities, but I chose this one because it's very nice and simple and it talks about, um, parametric amplification and squeezing in a very simple system, which is a cantilever resonator. So this is a little cantilever, which has a resonant frequency and it can be, uh, excited in two ways with a parametric drive and with a direct, uh, signal test drive. And, uh, what they do is they. Uh, they turn up the parametric drive until this uh, cantilever is very close to its in instability. With a parametric drive, you actually have instability. So, so if you drive hard enough, a system that's driven parametrically becomes unstable and spontaneously will, will start oscillating. Um, and so, so you can you turn this up to just below that point, and then that makes it very sensitive to uh, a signal coming in in phase with the parametric drive and very insensitive to a signal coming out of phase to the parametric drive. And this shows that. So this shows that with the pump off, no parametric drive, the noise, this you can think of as a noise, uh, figure of Merrick, uh, in noise in phase with the parametric drive in this direction and the out of phase in this direction. So it decompose the noise into two, two uh, phases. And you can see it's perfectly symmetric with no parametric drive. It's just regular random noise as you would expect. And with the parametric drive on, uh, the noise in phase with the, with the parametric drive is very is re greatly reduced and the noise out of phase is greatly increased. And just to you know, make it even more uh, simplistic, this is exactly what happens in a swing. Uh, in a swing, the, the parametric drive is the feet moving up and down that effectively modulates the, the mass, center of mass, moves the center of mass up and down, and that's a parametric drive for a pendulum. Um, 
And uh, if, this, if the kid on the swing, the swing is not going anywhere, it's stationary and starts moving the feet up and down, the swing won't move. You need to kick start it to get it to go. Now, if the feet were heavy enough and you move them up and down at the right frequency, you could, you could reach the instability point at which the swing would spontaneously start to move. But that's usually not what happens. Of course, usually in a swing, you, you push first and then you pump. But you could start pumping first. And if you start pumping first, a very small push would get you going if it's in phase with the pumping. And, and a very large push would not do anything if it's out of phase with the pumping. And that's, that's exactly what's going on here. How am I doing? Uh-oh, better hurry. So now I'm going to talk about another device, which is an optical mechanical resonator. Again, something that appears a lot in QIS research. What this is, is a resonant cavity um, that um, can conduct two different uh, <coughs> types of uh, vibrations. So, so in this case, light and sound. So, so this is a, a cavity in which phonons of a certain wavelength and light of a certain wavelength are both resonant. Of course, they're very different frequencies because the speeds are very different, but the wavelengths are the same and they're both resonant in this one cavity. And so they can entangle, photons and phonons can entangle. And this is used in QIS to uh, investigate phonon quantum entanglement properties because then you can measure the photons that come out. And this plot here shows the resonance, the photons on resonance here, and then plus one phonon or minus one phonon in the cavity, shifting the optical resonance by the energy of the phonon, which is tiny. And you can see the frequencies involved here. They're really, really close together. But optically, those, that, those frequencies can actually be distinguished. Whereas uh, the phonons, there's no hope of measuring these low energy phonons any longer. So this is, this is again, a device used for, for QIS investigations, but we can adapt it to measure phonons of very low energy, which is for dark matter, a very interesting proposition because very low mass dark matter produces phonons um, in materials. And so we can turn this into a, a very low energy, even though narrow band phonon detector. And there's, there's a paper about this device. I'm going to move faster. So there, this is changing gears a little bit into quantum materials, which is not, again, a sensor, but something that can be used as a target. And this slide is quite complicated. So I'm just going to skip it because of time and go to this one directly. And uh, this basically illustrates the connection between quantum materials research and uh, the connection to high energy physics. So in quantum materials research, a, a very common commonly studied material is a very common studied system, let's say, is the oxygen vacancies in diamond. So, so these are defects in the diamond lattice, which can be used to make qubits. So the defects themselves are like isolated two-state systems, and they can be uh, spin systems, and they can be used as, as, very, as, very, as a qubit candidate. So there's extensive theory, an extensive theory framework that was developed to understand and predict these oxygen oxygen vacancies in diamond. And this shows the results of that, which, which you can see in this paper here, and the kind of complexity that, that in energy levels that, is, that these systems have and that has been analyzed and, and calculated. So now these tools can be applied to the problem of calculating how does dark matter interact with the low energy levels in, uh, in material. So, so um, uh, diamond was a classic example because of the use in qubits, but this theory can be applied to any material. And in fact, in this paper, um, there's a survey of lots of different materials and what the cross sections are for dark matter models, cross sections versus, uh, versus dark matter mass. Uh, uh, so what is the reach of using this, any of these different materials as targets? And there's a lot more materials in the paper. I just took one plot. But basically this, this again is, taking advantage of all this infrastructure developed because of QIS and using it to calculate uh, uh, how we can be sensed, more sensitive to dark matter. And um, in the other area, uh, interesting area is helium quantum evaporation. So again, low mass dark matter particles uh, won't produce ionization or light in target materials, which are the things that current detectors look for. Um, if they're very low mass, they'll only produce collective excitations such as phonons. And so you only, your only hope is to detect these phonons. 
So photon detection is key to low mass dark matter searches. And so the question to pose for quantize is, what is the lowest possible phonon energy that we can detect with no noise, with no dark counts? So um, evaporation of helium atoms from the surface of superfluid helium is a promising mechanism because uh, it takes very little energy to evaporate these atoms, but they won't evaporate just spontaneously. You actually need to provide a phonon of this kind of energy to kick an atom off the helium surface. And so that's discussed in this paper. And so the question is how to detect single evaporated atoms with no dark counts. And, and I have three candidate systems being studied here. One is to use a qubit system um, that is actually built on helium layers, uh, a candidate qubit system. Uh, so taken directly from QAS research. Another one is with superconducting nanowire single photon detectors. And another one is with microcolor images, which is sort of what HEP is already doing, but it has to be improved a lot for this application. So the uh, qubit systems that have been developed with liquid helium are basically um, uh, uh, devices to control electric fields built uh, on CMOS uh, type uh, production lines. Uh, there's a picture right there. And then these are coated with a very thin film of helium, uh, which uh, can be used to trap electrons. And the electrons can be moved kind of like a CCD, but the electrons are moved on the surface. And this can be used to uh, to measure spins of very large numbers of spins, like 10 to the 9 or something in a square setting. So the idea is to put one of these devices above the, in this case, helium-3 uh, film that you're getting evaporation from. And helium-3 has to spin, and so that spin can be detected by these uh, electron systems on the surface. Even a single spin can be detected. So that's the idea here. And there's a paper uh, down here about the system. The, the actual detection paper is not out. Yeah. SNSPDs are a popular photo detector choice for QIS applications. And there's a paper that summarizes all the different things people are doing with SNSPDs in the QIS field. Now, unfortunately, they are a small area um, and the energy threshold while okay for photons, which is their main application, is too high for the energy deposited by a helium atom that absorbs onto the surface, which is only tens of MeV. Um, so under quantized, the idea is to make them bigger and make them lower thresholds so we can use them to detect these uh, evaporated atoms. And there's the paper. So and Maurice, before you rush forward. Um, you had a pop-up that appeared on your screen a few moments ago. And, ah, there it goes. Okay, yeah, it was, um, uh, Zoom was still allowing it to interfere destructively with your screen share, but now it seems to be fine. Okay, great. Yeah, I just cut, I just closed it. I saw it too. Yeah, no, uh, Zoom has a bad habit of ghosting like that, so. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so this is the last, uh, is it the last topic? It might, might be. But this is, again, this is the kind of detectors that are already being used in high energy physics, superconducting photon detectors. It's not the last one, uh, <laughs> um, which is a transition edge sensor uh, based a thermal photon detector. Um, and uh, the key here is that th there's a paper about how to how these are being pushed to lower threshold, but the, the R&D program here is to move these to much lower thresholds. And so uh, by reducing transition temperature, improving the collection efficiency, and understanding the lower environmental noise. So we have to get into, into the noise of current detectors, basically. And that has a strong con connection with the qubit technology research, because qubits have the same kind of problems with getting into, into noise. And then one, one last thing I wanted to mention is a different kind of phonon detector, which is a kinetic, kinetic inductant device, a kin, which is essentially it's really amazingly close to a qubit. And so that's really kind of to me an obvious connection. So the kinetic inductance device is an all LC resonator. Um, and, that, and that's just a simple harmonic oscillator system. It has energy levels that are evenly spaced. And what happens is that um, the, the inductance can be modulated by breaking Cooper pairs. And then that produces a signal. Uh, a qubit is exactly the same resonator with a nonlinear element stuck in, which is a Josephson junction. And what that does is it shifts some of the energy levels. So, it, so you have a two level system, a level with just two energy levels 
accessible, and then the rest of the energy level is pushed pretty far away where they're not going to couple to these two levels. Whereas in here, they're all equally spaced and they don't couple. So that's a qubit, and that's, a, that's an M kid. And so they're, like I said, essentially the same device. Um, but, th but this device is what we want to use to measure broken Cooper pairs. This device they want to measure to, they want to use to, to fill, to transition between these two systems, and they actually don't want any broken Cooper pairs. So when I say here, the nice feature is that the qubits vice is a phonon detector's virtue. So, so basically, qubits want no Cooper pairs broken. Phonon detectors want to detect every last Cooper pair that's, that's broken. Um, so, so that's, I think, a very nice connection there. And this is a setup at, at LBL that we're working on to measure an M kit here with um, uh, with uh, 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 back to what I showed earlier the the uh, squeezing uh, technique. So this is a this is a pump tone here that's put into a mixer before a parametric amplifier to uh, to uh, pr provide the squeezing signal to actually measure only one measure the signal with very low noise in the in phase with this pump tone and not measure it out of phase with that pump tone. Um, okay, so in conclusion, uh, the National Quantum Initiative is implemented with a science first focus. Uh, so in addition to the three NIST, uh, uh, NIST should say here, sorry, NIST centers, uh, there are now three NSF and uh, centers and five DOE of the science uh, uh, QIS centers. Uh, and, but in addition to the centers, those, there was a lot of uh, lead up to them. And one of them was this quantized program of the Hungary Physics Office of Science. Um, and uh, there it is again. And, um, and to apply QIS towards have goals. And so I covered the thrusts of this program, which were uh, the theory, theory work, which focuses on known connections between general relativity, quantum field theory, and quantum information. And NQI adds new platforms to test these theories and concepts. Uh, the computing, quantum computing, which focuses on essentially beta testing the uh, quantum computer hardware algorithms and simulation to solve Heinrich physics calculations and combinatorial problems. And the sensing and measurement, which is the largest part of the program, and also the harder one to clearly define. I presented examples ranging from Clearly using quantum computing and network technology to incremental work on pre-existing but QIS related technology. Uh, so NQI is not only adding to our detector toolkit in hydrogen physics, but also boosting R&D on ultra low noise technologies that we already, uh, that were already known, but, but need to be boosted. Uh, so thanks, thanks for your attention. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. And everyone can go ahead and react with applause. And if uh, from the, the reaction bar, we'll give you a little applause here too. <laughs> All right. Um, so it's time for Q and A. Um, and if you want to ask a question, just type the word "speak" in the chat window. Um, I actually have already received a question for you, Maurice, from one of the students in the audience. So I'm just going to read. They, they basically sent two questions. I'll read you the first one, check for others, and then read you the second one if no one else has uh, put themselves in the speaker queue. So um, this is from Austin Marstaller. So he introduced himself as a first year PhD applied mathematics student here at SMU, but feels very unfamiliar with the topic, which is fine. So the first question he asks is generally what mathematics is involved with this quantum sensing area, especially. So for instance, functional analysis, partial differential equations, number theory, combinatorics, things like that. Do you have a sense of that question? Uh... Well, I mean, it depends a lot on what what you're talking about. So, in the uh, but but for the, I mean, for the um, um, kind for the experimental applications involving sensing, you know, a lot of the calculations are basically the same as you would do for electronics. So they would basically just involve, um, you know, impedances and networks and matching and and you know differential equations and and known known uh, ways to deal with uh, with electronic uh, signals and calculate the electronic behavior so so that would be that would be very familiar to to you if you're looking at uh, at you know uh, impedance calculations yeah okay great yeah thank you maurice we have a question also from jacob southard again so let me scroll down here jacob you should be able to unmute now go ahead and ask 
Okay, well, I intended for it to be a typed question, um, but basically it was um, Mike Rogers, chairman of the Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence from 2011 until the year of um, a symposium on international order with the Federalist Society said that uh, China made a very good shot. Um, and I'm curious if the... Uh, H-E-P-Q-I-S, programmatic, programmatic thrusts uh, chart, as you figured it, gives any insight into the development of such technologies. Yeah, so I think, Jacob, you're, you're kind of asking about, there was a lot of headlines, especially in recent years, about uh, China developing an entangled photon quantum information sort of channel for themselves. Um, that's probably one of the more recent thing that's caught attention. Maurice, can you speak to that? Well, uh, not not very much. In, 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 but I mean, that's it's more. Um, I think what maybe what I could say is that uh, the National Quantum Initiative certainly, if you if you go back and look at the, the debates in Congress and that and so on, and the presentations, they definitely uh, were responding uh, also to. Um, similar investments happening in China. So, so, uh, so, so the US is not the only country investing in quantum information technology. Uh, everyone is, uh, um, including China. And uh, so there are programs in, in all over the world uh, coming up because it's a, a new technology that's of, of high interest um, uh, to everyone. So, so uh, uh, yes, yeah, so China had, had had this demonstration of teleportation of photons uh, up to a satellite and back, for example, something like that. Uh, and uh, you know, and, and there, but there are many other demonstrations of uh, that were not in China, in, in, in Europe, and so on, mm -hmm. of, of very interesting teleportation uh, achievements. Uh, and even in Switzerland, they had a um, an encrypted, uh, 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 let's say, uh, uh, an in, uh, quantum encryption. Kind of uh, con connection between two institutes that they would they were showing what worked. So it's um, yeah. I mean, I think a lot of the NQIs. Not I was not going to say a lot, but part of the NQI impetus was to you know respond to to uh, competition from other uh, countries. But that, I think the motivation. Uh, well, it, it hasn't been like. A, uh, prompted by the fact that, oh, China uh, suddenly is working on quantum information science, we'd better do too. No, as I show, as I hope, hope as, I, as I hope I showed, this has been a long time in the making, you know, mm -hmm. long before those headlines. All right, and next up, we have a question from Tim Hobbs. Just give me a second to get to you, Tim. Okay, Tim, you should be able to unmute. Yeah, thanks, Steve. And thanks, Maurice. This is a really interesting talk, and it's a very exciting time, um, everything going on. My question I wanted to ask, um, you mentioned a little bit about the quantum computation for large scale problems in HEP. And in particular, I thought I'd ask um, about the use of this quantum annealing. So I mean, we have very large multi-dimensional problems very often in high energy physics. Are there many instances that you could speak to where there are real demonstrations of quantum supremacy or are we at the level, would you say more of just proofs of principle still? Are there many demonstrated calculations where you could really outstrip yeah, so, a classical um, machine, for example? Right, and, so so the, the question of quantum supremacy, you might have also seen the headlines, Google claims they, they showed it and you know, people, that's kind of the goal of of many research projects is to demonstrate quantum supremacy, basically to, to show that a quantum computer actually can do better than a classical computer. Um, uh, in the case of annealers, it's a little bit different because the, the quantum annealers, uh, there's, all, there's kind of debate whether, there are, whether they're actually quantum computers at all, or they're just using qubits or something that you can also do classically. So there's classical right. annealers as well. Mm -hmm. so, so they're not just, they're, they're, which are not made with qubits mm -hmm. and they achieve the same thing. So an annealer is basically the icing model kind of thing where you basically have a large state, uh, uh, a large system of, of, of spins or other states uh, and, and you idiomatically, you know, change the, the some condition, some field or some temperature 
to to get put it into the true ground state as opposed to some uh, local menu because optimization problems the issue they have is that they get caught up in local minima and you actually want to find find the true solution the true ground state the lowest energy solution exactly. so this is this is what annealers are for and uh, and uh they um there's there's I, i'm not an expert in the subject but i've seen talks and papers about different kinds of annealers uh uh you know achieving the right solution um, faster or better than, than can be done by, uh, you know, linear computation, let's say. Uh, and right. so I think that's the fact that you can get to the right ground state by annealing uh, is, is, I think, well established. But, um, but the question, I get, if you get to the question of practicality, uh, you know, of course, still today, the best way to do anything is with commercial computers. You're not going to beat it by with some for a real life problem with some uh, with some uh, uh, demonstrator system but the question is what well, you know this is all for few what future systems be based on should it be based on cpus or, or annealers depending on the problem they attack and i think annealers have a place but they're like let's say co-processors so then an annealer would be a good co-processor to have on certain search sure. systems sure. that are going to solve these large problems Right. But so, I mean, these instances you mentioned, of which there are presumably maybe a small number where the annealer actually outperforms the classical calculation or finds this global minimum, say, faster, for example, or, right. or yeah. greater efficacy. Um, are these sort of practical calculations, would you say, at this point? Or is it still really just demonstrations? I think there are more demonstrations. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Yeah. All right. I can see Tim's mind bending toward the idea of a global optimization across PDF data sets now. There are many <laughs> other things, many, many, many other things. I mean, there's a lot of, of interest in this. Um, so I mean, it, but, but yeah, we have this question very often, how, how far off is this where we can actually really do- Well, I mean, the goodness I, I think until you can buy things commercially at a recent competitive cost, it, it's not there yet. So for example, the, the study of pattern recognition in high physics, even though you can show that it can be done and that it works, sure. if you actually want to uh, all, you know, reconstruct, you know, 10,000 events per second from the OHC data, uh, you're not going to, you know, you don't have, you can't get any sort of annealer that ha can possibly have that kind of throughput <laughs> of data. Right. Uh, it's just, they just don't exist yet. You know, what you can buy is stuff with you know gigabit links and so on, it's all you know standard computing. You're not, you're not going to buy some annealer with 100 gigabit links on it. It doesn't exist. You know, it's all, it takes a long time to load the data into. Sure, sure. Okay, well, thank you, Marie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we'll we'll take our last question from Pavel. Whoops, Pavel Lebelski. There we go. Oh, well, you should be able to unmute. So, oh, uh, pa Pavel, actually, hang on. Sorry, there's a problem with audio compression. In your microphone, it sounds it sounds like you're a very, very, very tiny chipmunk <laughs> when you're talking. Can you hear me now? Yes, perfect. Perfect. Well, Maurice, thank you very much for the talk. So I'm my team supervisor, and so when he comes and asks me to spend five thousand dollars on a six qubit quantum <laughs> computer, I probably will not agree. After, <laughs> uh, but let, let me ask you this. Um, uh, well, it, it, perhaps I missed it. So of course, uh, to make progress in the quantum computing, you need to work on the hardware, but also on the software. And I don't know if, if there is any progress on developing algorithms that will be, will be let's say, very suitable for high energy physics. And uh, w will there be any particular requirements for this algorithm? What What is the current status for this? Yeah. So so thanks. That's a that's a good question. So there, in fact, the 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 talk I showed the, the this paper I pointed to. This is an algorithm. Uh, of course, the thing about algorithms uh, right now is that. Uh, there is no um, Python for quantum computers yet that you can, or or Java or something that you can just write and then run on any system. All algorithms are system specific, mm -hmm. so they're like assembler code in in old computers, right? So so people are only writing assembler code for for quantum computers right now. So so just like you would write for for an, for an old proce processor. Um, uh, so that's the, but but yes, those algorithms are being written, they're developed, and there's a lot of 
work. I, I don't have uh, a list of reference, but I can give it to you offline if you're interested. Uh, but certainly, you know, that, that's that's the point is to develop the algorithms. Well, perhaps again, the, the, the question, well, uh, what, what might may be interested for us at SMU, uh, we don't have access to the actual quantum computing hardware, but we have uh, expertise in developing algorithms for uh, various applications. And so, uh, again, so the, well, the question to you from your, from, from your viewpoint, how, how can the universities like SMU be involved in this direction? Well, yeah. You do have access to the hardware because there's a lot of hardware yeah, that's so, or, yeah. accessible. Uh -huh. and, uh, and then and then you can basically, if you're interested in writing code, you just just c contact one of the centers that that, ha that is that that has that you know computing code area as their as part of their center, and, uh, and uh, they'll you know just work with them to to um, to uh, access. I mean, mostly you want to access simulation initially, mm -hmm. and you know you want to demonstrate the hardware is mainly used to to show that you can correct errors at this point. But if you want to show that an algorithm works, you're going to do it in simulation, because in the hardware all you're going to get is noise. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, if you want to get, if you want to show that the logic is correct in some or in some algorithm, or that algorithm is faster or better than some other algorithm, you're going to do that in simulation. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. Um, so I think with that, we'll go ahead and close out the event. Maurice, thank you very much for your time and your knowledge. We really appreciate this. And we hope you have a, a good afternoon and evening. And, and thanks to everybody. I hope you stay safe. It's easy to stay warm in Texas now, but it wasn't a few days ago. So just make sure to reach out to the community if there are things you need. Okay, bye everybody.